At the heart of the artfully constructed narrative about the German bombing raids on Britain that we know today as the Blitz, lies a terrible secret, one which has been forgotten for many decades. Over 52,000 civilians were killed in Britain during the Second World War, assumed by most people to have been victims of German bombs. In fact, as many as half of the casualties were caused not by the German Air Force, but rather by artillery operated by the British Army. After the Germans bombed Britain in the First World War by Zeppelin and aeroplane, it was realised that there was no real defence against air raids. Attempts to use heavy artillery to shoot down aircraft had proved futile. Indeed, it had been worse than futile as the shells had done no damage to enemy aeroplanes but had instead fallen to the ground and exploded, killing many civilians. As Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin so succinctly put it in 1932, the bomber will always get through. In September 1940, a year after the beginning of the Second World War, German bombers appeared in the skies of Britain and began trying to break the country by destroying both the physical infrastructure and also the ordinary person's will to resist. Because no apparent attempt was made to defend cities against the bombers, public morale plummeted and there was a real risk of mass flight from the cities in search of safety in the countryside. To prevent this, Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered artillery to begin a vast barrage across London and other cities. Shells weighing 80 pounds, that's over 36 kilograms, were hurled into the air above London by heavy guns and even the armoured turrets of battleships were taken off boats and positioned in and around the capital. You can see in the thumbnail to this video one such turret on top of Primrose Hill near London Zoo. Other turrets were taken from warships and placed on Wanstead Flats in East London and also in uh, various places south of the river. The heavy shells delivered by such naval guns were perfect when used against large, slow-moving targets such as enemy warships. If the target were missed, then the shells simply landed in the ocean. Nobody in his senses, though, would think it a good idea to take such a powerful piece of ordnance lug it up onto a hill overlooking central London and then start firing shells up into the air above London. The shells, both from these and other types of artillery used, could either be set to explode on impact or they could be timed to detonate after a certain uh, period, ideally when the shell was level with the enemy aircraft. The timers were clockwork devices uh, like those used in the kitchen to tell you when to take something out of the oven. In the 1930s, clocks made by Swiss and German companies were used, but because of the war, it was not possible to get hold of stuff like that from Europe anymore, so the British began making their own inferior and unreliable copies of such timers. The chances of actually hitting fast-moving aircraft with artillery in this way were negligible, but the roar of the guns firing over 10,000 shells a night was cheering and reassuring to the inhabitants of London. The idea was that the shells would explode near enemy aircraft, but because many of the timing mechanisms were, as I say, defective, and according to some estimates, uh, almost wholly unreliable, half the shells only exploded when they came down in city streets. Not only were the shells not of the highest quality, neither were the men who were responsible for firing them. The best of the conscripts, of course, uh, during the war went to the fighting units of the Army, Navy and Air Force. Those who ended up in the anti-aircraft batteries tended to be those no other service wanted. Consider the 31st Anti-Aircraft Brigade. Out of a thousand recruits, 50 could not be used for duty because they were unsafe to be felt out on their own. Another 20 were mentally defective, and 18 had such physical disabilities that they were unfit for any other unit. They were such men who were responsible for making the most complex and intricate calculations to ensure that shells detonated at the correct height. 
The first disaster came just 24 hours after the beginning of the Blitz on 7th of September 1940. The following day, an artillery shell landed outside a cafe near King's Cross, killing 17 people. From then on, the death toll from the anti-aircraft fire was constant and unrelenting. Less than a week later, on the 14th of September 1940, members of the Women's Royal Naval Service were sitting down to dinner at the Mansfield House Hotel in Leon Solent, where they were billeted. A shell fired by artillery in Portsmouth flew through the window of the dining room and exploded, killing ten of the young women. According to some experts working on the proximity fuse in the later years of the war, at least as many civilians were killed by artillery fire during air raids as died from enemy bombs. In the Midlands district of Tipton, for example, 23 civilians were killed during air raids during the Second World War. 11 of these were caused by German bombs, but 12 died during a single incident on the 21st of September 1940 when a wedding celebration was taking place in a pub in the village of Tibbydale. An artillery shell weighing 28 pounds, that's 12 and a half kilograms, was fired from nearby Rowley Hills and sailed down the chimney of the building where the party was being held. The bride was killed, the bridegroom lost both his legs and 11 other guests died. This shell came from a 3.7 inch gun. The number of injuries and deaths from anti-aircraft fire was no secret during the war. Deaths from the British artillery were widely reported in both national and provincial newspapers, despite the censorship operating at that time. On the 29th of March 1944, for example, the Western Mail reported that anti-aircraft shells, one of which exploded in a crowded factory killing 12 people, including seven women, and injuring as many more were the chief cause of damage during activity over the South Wales coastal area on Monday night. The great irony of the whole business was that hardly any aeroplanes were actually shot down by the artillery which wrought such havoc in the cities of Britain. General Frederick Pyle, the officer in overall command of the anti-aircraft defences, calculated that his men would have needed to fire 20,000 artillery shells to have a realistic chance of shooting down a single aeroplane. Even if, as sometimes happened, a bomber was, against all the odds brought down, the consequences were even worse for those in the cities. I'm sure that you, everybody remembers a modern instance of a large aeroplane crashing in the middle of a city. Just think back to the 9-11 attacks in New York. When a German bomber loaded with high explosives was brought down and crashed onto a city, the results were much worse than if it had simply been left unmolested to continue its mission. Even when the shells did explode where they were supposed to, that is to say thousands of feet overhead, they still caused injury and death to the people below. The popular image of people huddled in air raid shelters during the blitz is misleading, more than half the people, the majority, simply stayed in their homes or walked the streets as usual during a raid. Every shell which exploded above cities produced dozens of pieces of heavy shrapnel, such as this. This is a nose cone of a shell from a 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun. It was fired from a gun emplacement in Wellbone Lane in the East London district of Chadwell Heath and fell to earth in somebody's back garden travelling at 200 miles an hour. It weighs over a pound. Many people were struck by bits of metal of this kind. The tens of thousands of men, women and children in this country who died at the hands of their own army have now been almost wholly forgotten. Perhaps we prefer to remember them as heroic martyrs whose lives were lost in a noble cause. This at least ties in with the mythic narrative of the Blitz. In the description to this video I give links to the incidents about which I have been talking.